Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Sustainable Gas Institute's annual lecture uh, for 2021. Very pleased to have you here, uh, wherever you may be joining us from the world. Just a few housekeeping points before we kick off. Firstly, just to highlight that uh, if you want to listen to this annual lecture in a different language, it is in fact possible. There are subtitles are possible in six different languages and you should go to your settings uh, if, if you wish to do that. We're going we're gonna to be talking to Angela Needle today and I assume many of you will have questions. Uh, we will have a Q&A at the end of the lecture. Uh, can I please invite you to publish or to submit questions via the Q&A, which you should see uh, somewhere on your screening, depending on what type of device you're using. Uh, so submit questions there and we, we will get to answering them at the end of the at, at the end of the session. Next slide, please. So firstly, just a couple of minutes just to to remind you all and for those who are new to us what the SGI is at Imperial College. The Sustainable Gas Institute was established in 2014 and, and you see our mission statement there. So it's thought leadership, authoritative interdisciplinary evidence and analysis on the role of gas in future low carbon energy systems. And a real emphasis here that this is not just about natural gas. And this is about any gaseous energy vectors and we're interested in, in the interplay between them and how they may support future net zero or even net negative carbon energy systems. Next slide, please. So why is this interesting and, and what do we focus on? So we are Imperial College, probably most of you know, we're a very science and technology focused university. So we are very interested in the engineering and the technology behind gas based systems. Uh, but also equally we're interested in the environment and particularly in this context, climate change and other interdisciplinary factors like economics, energy security and policy and regulation. Now, when the when the Sustainable Gas Institute was first established, it was really based upon this challenge you see on the left of the screen there, where you see this pressure from climate change and carbon budgets sort of putting a question mark, particularly over the use of unabated natural gas in the future. On the other hand, we saw a lot of new natural gas sources worldwide, particularly unconventionals, uh, an unconventional boom, increasing LNG trade, etc. I think it's fair to say the debate has moved on a fair bit since then, and now it's much more like I say about the role of say abated gas, but also hydrogen and bioenergy related gas. Next slide, please. So what do we do? Uh, a bunch of different things. So firstly, we have evidence based reviews. I'll talk about that more in just a moment. We do particularly focus on hydrogen uh, of great interest globally, both blue and green hydrogen, all of the infrastructure related to it and all the possible end uses of hydrogen from across sectors from industry all the way to residential and transport. We also have a strong research theme on methane emissions, so that data on how much the emissions are, where they are in supply chains, what their climate impact is, and particularly what can be done about it. Uh, we have a strong energy systems modeling team um, that using optimization and agent based modeling approaches to try to find pathways and show decision makers how to achieve low carbon targets. Uh, we also have member specific research, so we work on particular topics of interest to the members of the Institute. Uh, next slide, please. So I mentioned evidence based reviews, so we run a white paper series. Some of you will have seen this before. Uh, way back in 2015, we published our first, first one on methane and CO2 emissions in natural gas supply chains. We've gone through various infrastructure, carbon capture and storage, transport, a, a deep dive on the flexibility that gas may provide future energy systems, and most re recently, the best uses of natural gas in Paris ag Agreement compliance scenarios. So whether or not natural gas has a role, I would uh, encourage you to take a look at these. They're, they're, they're a good read and nice brief synopses also available. Next slide, please. 
Okay, so that's enough about us. Uh, what we're really here today to, to hear is from Dr. Angela Needle, who is Director of Strategy at Cadent Gas. Uh, so she's responsible for the transformational strategies of the company, including decarbonisation plans for the UK and hydrogen projects across residential and industrial sectors. Prior to this, she held positions at Centrica, including heading their contracting strategy that supports 10,000 British gas engineers. And she also ran the business energy services strategy and took responsibility for all energy supply and services customer propositions. Before Centrica, uh, she was at Anglican Water, including managing uh, sewer networks, heading an R&D program and basically being responsible for all things energy, carbon and climate change. She's a big advocate for the environment and diversity issues and a founder of the Women's Utilities Network. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Angie. So over to you, Angie, please. We're looking forward to hearing uh, what you have to say. Thanks, Adam. Hi, everybody. Um, it's always weird hearing somebody talk about your biography, um, but I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about myself in a moment. If you want to move over, um, to the next slide. Um, be, before I start, I mean, I'm going to be talking about the role of hydrogen in heating specifically today. Um, and many of you will know that hydrogen has uh, a key role in getting to net zero across a range of different use cases across power generation, industrial use, um, which I will touch on actually, but on, on transport too. But I'm going to talk particularly about heat today. It's a very emotive topic, something that I have much discussion and debate about from a strategic uh, point of view. But let me tell you a little bit more uh, about myself before before I kick off. I, I started out um, caring about the environment from my school days. I remember drawing the globe and the old greenhouse effect um, and uh, it was called global warming back then and uh, when, when I remember having my careers chat at school and when you wanted to do something green uh, back then which by the way was quite some years ago um, you weren't you were given options of working in water or in forestry because um, that's the green things that were on offer and energy the energy sector wasn't something that was really discussed as much as a, a green career um, path so luckily for me, I ended up at Anglian Water, where I ended up at and um, the rest, as they say, is history. But I've, I'm not a gas expert, by the way. I'm not an engineer by training. My experience is through setting strategies that help me. And so I find myself at Caden, where I, I actually left century. Hydrogen happened. I wanted to be part of this journey. <laughs> and I apologise, I've got a bit of a cough, so um, please do bear with me. I've also really been, um, uh, just been appointed as the Vice President of Hydrogen UK, which is the new trade association looking at um, exploring the whole value chain of hydrogen in the UK, ensuring that we really work together to get what we need to happen to make the hydrogen economy work in the UK. And um, of course, as uh, Adam mentioned in my spare time, I'm a huge supporter of increasing the diversity of people within our amazing sector. Um, and I'm a, a co-founder co of the Women's Utility Network, which is really about making utilities a place where women can thrive and stay and have amazing careers. So, and if you want to follow me on LinkedIn, there's my uh, QR code because I often say things about hydrogen. You might be interested in that. So, right, if you can move me on a slide, let's let's tell you about what I'm going to talk about. Um, Caden is a <coughs> company that I work for as strategy director. Has got 11 million customers. Uh, um, that's pretty much half of the gas distribution market. We've got over 6,000 employees and a mere 132,000 kilometres of pipeline. And this is pipeline that you've already paid for. Um, and it today it delivers natural gas um, to people's homes and businesses up and down the country. And, you know, my job is to sort of sit and think about this and go, OK, well, pipeline delivers natural gas today. What are we going to do with it in the future when we 
we have to move shift away from natural gas. What kind of role can it play in getting to net zero? And how do we do, how do we plan our way um, to get that? And then we'll be repurposed to hydrogen and there may be some work that we choose to decommission or, or even reroute or change. Problem that we're talking about here. Thank you. So and you may <coughs> I hope many of you have seen this kind of chart before. Uh, 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 the the uh, the UK's energy statistics data and I like these sort of slanky diagrams that show you where energy flows but this is just gas right so so we use uh, about 900 terawatt hours of gas in the UK at the moment and and so we, it really does still underpin and a third of that goes to heat people's homes about 300 terawatt hours for domestic heating that's that's 17 percent of all carbon emissions in the UK. It's absolutely huge. And one of the challenges that gas has and one of the one of the problems that it solves is that you can store it and you can keep it for when it's cold. And um, famous chart down on the left hand side there, which is huge. The gas network is in providing energy when it is needed um, six times more than the electricity network. It really down as we need it to do and is obviously linked to providing heat uh, in the winter principally. So if you move me on to the next slide, please. So I'm going to talk about that bit that is heating. And as we move towards net zero, we've got to think about how we can replace all of the natural gas in people's homes with something else. And that something else is a range of different things. So we've talked about um, views on this, but there's um, heat, heat pumps will play a significant role, district heating also, um, and there may be a role for hydrogen. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that in a moment. If you can move me on, please. Thank you. So let's talk about heat for a minute. Um, so I've already said that 300 terawatt hours of natural gas goes to heat homes. Many of you on this call will have a gas boiler. I have no doubt I've got one in my home. It is fantastically reliable. It fits in a cupboard, doesn't cause me a great deal of problem. Of course, you know when it's not working. The gas supply is pretty much always there. You've never run out of gas, I shouldn't imagine. And um, it, do, it does what it needs to do. It, you, and and the, the people love boilers, right? Um, well, they don't really love boilers, let's be honest, but they love the fact that it's controllable. It provides heat when they need it. You know, you can turn it up and turn it down. And you, it, towards this has been a great source of heating because natural gas was less carbon intensive than things like coal that was used previously to heat people's homes. But we can't have natural gas anymore. We've got 22 million homes on the gas grid. So what do we do? The CCC's estimated 250 billion pounds is going to be needed to be spent to decarbonise heat. Um, that's about 11,000 pounds per home. And that includes energy efficiency, as well as new appliances, as well as um, changes to the electricity and the gas network that will be needed to get us to net zero. So don't forget that every single house is going to need to have some kind of, of change. So when I've taken some time to have a little think about how these things stack up, um, heat's going to, decarbonisation of heat in homes is going to require sort of three aspects as I see it. You've got the technical aspects and what kit and equipment do we need? What kinds of solutions are there. There's the economic side of things, which is how much do they cost? Um, and But more importantly, there's a the consumer aspect. And we tend to forget about consumers when we're thinking about the big picture solutions. But um, history with the solutions made about what people and it causes a significant amount of uncertainty things and behave in a particular way. So we really do need to have all these three things all together thought through. Oops. Thank you. Sorry, cough for a moment. So, so let's talk about the heating problem in a little bit more detail. Many of you will have seen this kind of slide um, for this is from work that Tato did. Now. The UK does not have particular 
I mean, the buildings are amazing, right? But the there's a historical range, there's a massive diversity, they're hugely inefficient when it comes to uh, keeping heat in. Um, and by far the worst in Europe, and you look at this chart and it shows you that over five hours, how the temperature changes um, when it's zero degrees outside or in, in certain types of buildings. And, you know, we, use, we, we lose three degrees very, very quickly. So we've got poorly insulated buildings, and obviously using less energy is a key place to start when it comes to net zero. The other thing that, well, and this is largely shown here, so we have um, EPC ratings of, of buildings, energy performance certificates. We could have a de debate about how good those uh, criteria are for assessing the energy efficiency of buildings. But today, we've still got a huge amount of properties that are D and below. Um, and, you know, that is a significant amount that has to be, uh, has to be addressed. <coughs> so 80%. Built, you know, eight percent of buildings that exist today will still be in in 2050. So the ones that we've got and what we're going to have, and 61 percent of those are still over D. So let's talk about the other problems. So we've got the types of the buildings and their their energy performance, but we've also got the challenge of who owns them, and the ownership model in the UK is is actually moving more towards own uh, outright ownership as, as being the main challenge. Now that is an issue, right? Because um, when you own your home in its entirety, and you're neither a renter nor in social housing with heating in that particular property, um, and it tends to be the that bit that is the hardest to reach when it comes to government policy. So we can't make changes when it comes to um, forcing renters, landlords to um, only rent properties, which is certain EPC rating. Um, there are things that we could do on mortgages. So when a property change hands, it can only change hands if it's got a certain um, low carbon heating solution. So there is a problem to solve and there's a diversity of different sort of ownership models, social housing, landlords, renters and owners, which means we have to segment the solutions that we've got for people um, rather than just thinking we've got a one size fits all plan. So let's talk a little bit about hydrogen and heating, which is my favourite topic. And let's let's try and understand a little bit more about what what role hydrogen really has. And it's still not clear yet, by the way, how much hydrogen is going to be used uh, for heating. But let me tell you a little bit more um, about that. So how much hydrogen do we need? Well, it depends on what you what you look at. You know, there's a lot on how much hydrogen we might need for uh, heating and for other um, aspects as well. So th th this chart put together based on lots and lots of different pathways that are available on how to how much hydrogen we need to get to net zero. Um, the little bit in orange is the, the bit of hydrogen needed for, for heating. And just draw your attention to the balance pathway that was put out by the CCC and their headwinds pathway. Um, so one's got 23 terawatt hours of hydrogen for heat and one's got 182 terawatt hours of hydrogen for heat. Um, and these pathways could still both unfold. Too, and, and the difference between them comes down to the customer acceptance and adoption of, of heat pumps, and therefore what you need to do if it's not accepted and rolled out at the rate required. So from a gas sector point of view, it's very difficult to plan for a future that has this much uncertainty in it, um, which is quite astonishing, really. We've got you know a future where we might only have 20 terawatt hours for heating, or we might have 200, um, or anywhere in between. So our role really in the gas sector is make sure that we are absolutely clear that um, the technical and safety aspects of hydrogen can be delivered such that it is ready for when it is needed. And then when we go through the planning process of thinking about hydrogen and electrification at a local level, we know what can be done. Um, and, and I'll just say something else, actually, even if you've still got a very, very small amount of hydrogen in the gas networks for heating, you're still going to have to do all the testing and the evidence and the safety work that we are doing today 
So what we're doing is making sure, is creating optionality for the delivery um, of low carbon heat. Angie, Angie, sorry to interrupt you. Could we please ask you to turn off your video because we're having some audio issues in, in the room. So if, you're, if your video is off, then maybe it'll be a bit better. Thank you very much. Alrighty, and I'm, I'm really sorry to hear that. Um, hopefully you've managed to get the, the gist of what I've been saying. Let me know if you need me to go over anything because I can do that too. I think it's okay, just continue. For me, it's understandable, thank you. Alrighty, all right, so so let's let's talk a bit about what the government's saying about about hydrogen. So it's a great piece of work that have been produced over the last year. Um, we, obviously, we had the six carbon budget, which I, I urge you all to have a look at. If you've not, it says quite a lot about the things that we need to do as a country to get to net zero. Um, it is it covers everything right from land use and and um, transport to buildings and infrastructure. It's very helpful. Um, brilliantly, though, the government produced its hydrogen strategy in um, in August uh, this year and what the hydrogen strategy did and we were you know we, we did quite a lot of work to uh, push for a hydrogen strategy as soon as possible it's quite hard to invest in hydrogen infrastructure if you don't know what the UK's targets are but we've got one now the targets are helpful right so we've got five gigawatts of production planned by 2030 there's a real great focus on industrial clusters and making sure hydrogen is available for those and industry to start decarbonisation. And from a heating point of view, it set out a pathway to make a decision on hydrogen in the gas network, which included a hydrogen neighbourhood, a hydrogen village and a town by 2030 and a decision on the role of hydrogen in the gas network by 2026. It also talks really positively about hydrogen blended into the gas network and I'll tell you about some of the projects we've been doing on that um, a bit later. And um, if you can move me on to the next slide, so let, let's just let's just touch on why hydrogen uh, boilers and heat pumps tend to be sort of pitched against each other. Um, and just to put it out there, us at Caden as a gas network are very supportive of heat pumps. I know it sounds like an unusual thing to say, but we need all these technologies to get to net zero and they do slightly different things um, and there'll be reasons why consumers prefer one over another and what we shouldn't do is exclude choice at this stage because we need to back a number of different horses but let me tell you what i hear when we talk about heat pumps and i'll tell you what i hear when we talk about hydrogen appliances as well so heat pumps they are a mature and proven technology you can buy one today and they work Right, they can be deployed now and they are efficient, right? So they've got this three to one efficiency ratio. So if you have a well insulated home or a new build, um, this is a great option for you. And they have lower running costs, of course, because they use less energy overall. Um, and, and I've got sto lots of positive stories about heat pump installations and the fact that they keep your war homes warm and toasty. However, and that we've got however's on, on all of these technologies, they are not necessarily suitable for all properties, right? It really does depend on how leaky energy efficiency your building is. Um, and they can be quite expensive. So this initial upfront capital cost is one of the barriers at the moment. And what the government has done is put in lots of effort to see if we can innovate to reduce this upfront capital cost, which is seen as a significant barrier to consumers. Because let's be honest, most people don't have 10 grand to invest in a heat pump. Um, there are, is a view that it can increase energy bills, right? Because it, it, it uses electricity to run and electricity is expensive today. Um, tomorrow, that might be future as electricity prices go down. Um, and there's some other limitations with the supply chain. We're only installing about 30,000 heat pumps. I think that will have doubled by the end of this year, but it's still small in the grand scheme of how many heat pumps we need. Um, and it does require consumers to change their behavior. Right, and I hear lots of things about it takes up space and there'll be blackouts and what do you do if you put too much pressure onto the electricity network. But the fact is, is that these these solutions work and you can have them today. And then on the flip side, I'll talk about <coughs> hydrogen. So hydrogen boilers don't exist yet, of course, but here's one in a home that you can come and see if you wanted to. And um, I'll tell you about that in a moment. So 
On the plus side, hydrogen boilers are going to cost the same amount as gas boilers. So the, the upfront capital is low. Um, and they can use it. We can use the existing gas network to provide hydrogen to those appliances. So in the home, it's less disruptive. It doesn't need the same space as a heat pump and you can fit it into the same hole that your current boiler is in. It's familiar to customers and it adds resilience to your overall energy system because this unit uses uh, hydrogen in, in the winter and doesn't rely on electricity at peak. And so one of the challenges is delivering energy at the peak of winter. But of course, there are downsides with hydrogen too. Um, you can't buy a hydrogen boiler today. Um, the general public have safety concerns when they hear about hydrogen. Um, this hydrogen boiler has yet to have a, like a hydrogen standard, but safety concerns will be addressed. And just to assure everybody, we won't be putting hydrogen in the gas network unless it's all been approved by the health and safety executive. Um, there is there is a view that they're inefficient, of course, because we need energy to make hydrogen and hydrogen to make heat. So in the grand scheme of efficiency, they are much less efficient than a heat pump. Um, and your gas bills are going to go up, right? Because natural gas today is cheap. We don't know yet what the price of hydrogen might be in the future, but to make it affordable to customers, some kind of support mechanism is going to be needed for the price of hydrogen, which is the same as what happened with um, uh, wind turbines when they first were first installed. Um, they, they had a, a support mechanism um, and that, that is what hydrogen is going to need because it needs to get to scale in order for the prices um, to fall. Um, there's other things that I hear. So I hear people say that gas sector is stopping you from having a heat pump by telling you hydrogen's coming. Um, it's sort of, I can see how people might think that, but we are looking at solutions that customers uh, would benefit from, and we know we need a mixed solution um, to get to net zero. We also hear about the differences between blue and green and other colours of hydrogen. Um, which is a cause of confusion for customers, actually. Um, and so we need to just start talking about low carbon hydrogen. Um, and it's great that the UK government have putting forward a standard for low carbon hydrogen. So we don't have to talk about colours anymore because it's confusing. We can just talk about low carbon hydrogen and having a trajectory towards the lowest carbon hydrogen that we can. Um, <coughs> Hydrogen boilers still produce some nitrous oxides, by the way, but um, the boiler manufacturers have yet to publish their data on that. But anecdotally, I think it will be um, significantly lower um, than gas boilers from early tests, but we'll wait and see. Um, I actually didn't put on this slide that they don't produce any carbon monoxide, which is also a benefit. But you, so you can see that there's sort of these, there's pros and cons on both sides, right? So one uses an existing infrastructure and needs low upfront capital costs, but higher uh, cost to customers on an operational basis. And heat pumps on the other side of our higher capital costs and a potentially lower operating costs. So there's sort of swings and roundabouts here. Um, and the different solutions, they do different things. So um, try and sort of explain to people is that you can look at things at an individual house level, but then you need to look at things from a, na a na national level as well. So the sort of punchline for heat pumps is for your individual home is that it's efficient, right? Um, and it's suitable for many buildings, but it's expensive to begin with, um, depending on whether you get your subsidy or not, right? And then Hydrogen boilers, it will be a familiar solution. It won't cost us much up front, but we don't know what the price of hydrogen is going to be yet. But nationally, going to need, if we have heat pumps everywhere, you're going to need an electricity network that's going to support the delivery of electricity to heat pumps day in, day out, at peak and when it's not windy. So you need a really well thought through and very resilient electricity network to enable that to happen. And we've just seen over the last uh, week or so what a storm has, has caused in disruption to people's homes. So we don't want a system that has more of that in it. We want it to have less of that. And then hydrogen obviously enables energy to be stored, which means that, um, yes, you need more renewables in the first instance to um, uh, 
uh, to generate the hydrogen, but you can use any surplus power to, to make hydrogen and store it for when you do need it. So um, when you look at, uh, I guess what I'm trying to say is that we're, it's not going to be all electricity or all hydrogen from a heating point of view. Both of those extremes are problematic. You need something somewhere in between that mixes these technologies together to have a, um, a resilient system. I'll just check in with you, Adam, that you can hear me OK now. It, it's it's much, much better, Angie. Thanks. Wonderful. OK, so let's just talk about the cost of these things, because actually that's what this comes down to, the cost to customers. Um, we did a little bit of our own work on the annualised costs of um, different technologies, and, and they're really broad, right? They're broad because excuse me, they're, they're abroad because of some uncertainties and the, and the uncertainties sit along um, different axes. So I'm um, just to tell you what you're looking at here. We've just got a chart showing the, the expected lifetime costs of ownership of an air source heat pump, a hybrid, hybrid system or a hydrogen system um, in 2035. And the reason why they're so uncertainty about some things to make these assumptions. So the cost of hydrogen is hugely uncertain. The cost of a heat pump and the amount of retrofit needed insulation wise to work effectively um, is, is unknown because we know the cost today, but we we expecting them to come down in the future. So anybody who says to you one thing's cheaper than another, it really does depend on the situation. It depends how close folks are to the hydrogen supply and also um, how much reinforcements need in the electricity grid. But principally, it comes down to the cost of the kit, the cost of hydrogen. As you can see, you know, if you were picking a winner, it might be a bit tricky in that particular context. So let me talk to you a little bit about consumers because this is where they really fit in and as I said before um, uh, history is littered with um, plenty of um, uh, policies land as well as expected smart metering being one of those because we might have misunderstood or uh, or not really evaluated how we bring customers on the journey with us and I believe for heating uh, how we interact with customers is going to be absolutely everything. Um, so let's move on to the next slide. Thank you. So here's <coughs> some of the things that customers are going to have to expect to encounter to get to net zero. This is one of the CCC slides. How many of the actions that are going to require um, consumers to change their behaviour? So we think 59% of all the actions that were put forward in the CCC six carbon budget require people to do something different today. That includes reducing meat consumption, um, re reducing flights and, and travel generally and adopting low carbon solutions such as um, uh, adopting electric vehicles, a new heating system in your home insulation and a rapid uptake of these technologies. So this is got it's not going to be done to us like we're going to have to take part in this revolution. If you move on to the next slide, please. And, and the public says, and this date is a little bit old now, um, so post copy it might be a bit higher, but the public says that they're really concerned, right, uh, about net zero. 75% of the public are concerned about climate change. Yet, moving on to the next slide, this is the result of this care. Right. And I put this out there on purpose because this is the litter left behind after an unlocking frenzy in the in the summer. And this made my heart sink, to be honest with you, because there's a huge difference, as you might have guessed, between what we ask people and what they say versus what they do. Right? Intent versus action. And so we can do all the surveys in the world. Um, but we really need to take consumers with us and make it easy. And this gap between intention and action is created by the, is the, is the consequent of effort versus the impact. How much effort is it going to take me to implement something? And so when we're talking about changing um, appliances and new heating systems, that just feels like effort to a lot of people and effort that they don't have or they don't understand. And I think that's really important. So what, what else can I tell you? Um, <coughs> we've done some of our own research at Cadence 
um, just about um, uh, people's perceptions in relation to climate change. So only 16% of the public thought that natural gas was a, sign a very significant contributor um, to climate change. So we're already behind when it comes to consumers' perceptions that their gas boiler um, is, is doing some harm. Um, and if you move me on to the next slide, please. Um, very few have plans to change or desire really. Um, so whilst and this is just a piece of research that we've done on um, what actions are you likely to take? So this little chart says in the dark blues, I'm already doing it. I'm thinking about doing it. I'm not going to do it. I'm not sure if I can. If I'm not sure about it. Um, so the the unfortunately the the whole chart hasn't been um, transposed over, but only 39% of people thought felt that um, switching away from natural gas heating was something that they'd think about doing. That's not very many in the grand scheme of things, and don't forget we need every single home, every single 22 million homes on the gas network to have something different. Thank you. Um, and when we talk to people about what they need, like what they don't want is an energy supplier or probably even a gas network company to tell them what to do. Um, there is real need for trusted advisors in this space. And most of our consumers trust their, um, you know, local tradesperson or a local um, NGO way more than um, an energy supplier or even the council. So we've got a way to go to help provide this education uh, to customers. <coughs> so let me tell you a little bit about what we are doing um, from a cadent point of view. So, we're, so we, we now know that we've got to take customers on the journey with us. We know that we're going to need a proportion of hydrogen, but we don't quite know how much yet. So in order to for those things to become certain, what, what are we doing in, in the gas network? Doing a range of projects in the gas networks. Um, first of all, we are looking at um, a conversion of 100 to 100 percent hydrogen and what that would really entail. Um, so when we're thinking about 100 percent conversion, we're talking about can the existing gas network take hydrogen at 100 percent? And if it can't, which bits might we need to change? Right. So. Um, we've got a project called H21, which is testing up and down the country all um, of our gas network to see whether it's capable of transporting 100% hydrogen. So don't forget, we've been replacing the gas network in the UK with a plastic gas network um, and continue to do so. And that's just from a maintenance and mains replacement programme. Um, if you're going to pick a, a, a material to transport hydrogen, it would be plastic. And by, and by the way, that doesn't mean the other materials in the ground today can't transport hydrogen. It just means we've got to test them and we just need to understand um, the pressures and the materials that we've got, and what we can, what we can do. So that programme's um, in place. That's called H21. We've also been um, developing um, the in-home aspects of hydrogen with, with government. So um, the high for heat programme has looked at all aspects of hydrogen in the home. So we're looking at hydrogen in the gas network. Government's been looking at hydrogen in the home and they've covered everything from. Um, uh, can you see it on with a flame? Um, do you need to add an odorant to it? Um, if you knock a nail in, you know, your gas pipe when you're fitting a new bit getting bored does it leak what happens if it leaks where does it accumulate in the property how 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 readily combustible is it you know and the real positive things here is that whilst hydrogen it has a broader explosive range than methane does it's a very light gas it takes up more space it dissipates really quickly it produces no carbon monoxide so there's actually quite a lot of benefits of having hydrogen in the gas network over over methane but because it is a different gas we're having to think through um, how we can repurpose as much of our existing gas ne network as possible to be converted to hydrogen. There may be some aspects like um, governors and pressure um, pressure management devices that we need to change to support hydrogen. So um, this is the hydrogen show home that we've built um, in Gateshead with our friends 
our northern gas networks um, with support from base funding. It's a very normal semi-detached house, um, but in it has got hydrogen boilers, cookers, fires. Um, and if you pop onto the next slide, they make a, a, a picture of the hydrogen hob. So um, it's got beautiful orange flame. Uh, people will say, but surely hydrogen burns without uh, colour. I can assure you no colourant has been added here. Um, and, and it's just the, the way that the burners have been um, developed. Now, the purpose of this house isn't to start going on about hydrogen for cooking and things like that, but it's really to show what can be done. The sort of seeing is believing side of things, the hydrogen boilers here, Baxi and Wusterbosch in there are um, working. They're absolutely brilliant. These houses are toasty warm, probably a little bit too toasty warm, actually. But uh, you can go and visit these homes. You can book a visit on that link on the slide. There. Just a couple more things to tell you. So 100% hydrogen. We do quite a lot of work on blending. Um, uh, most domestic appliances can receive a 20% blend of hydrogen. They're tested to 23% without them needing anything different inside. Might be slightly different for commercial appliances, by the way. So we're doing some work on commercial appliances too. But if you can put 20% hydrogen into the gas network today, that is a 6% emissions reduction. Uh, in carbon dioxide. Now, I know people will go, well, that doesn't sound like very much, but there's lots that we need to do to get to net zero. And this is a helpful stepping stone because what this does is it breaks the sort of chicken and egg situation between um, uh, hydrogen producers having to find a, a, a demand, a consumer for that amount of hydrogen. And um, so if production can be put into the gas network, you can really scale up production. And don't forget, if you're going to convert anywhere to 100% hydrogen, you're going to need to, to give 20% to places to take it off them again in the future. Um, so it's quite, this is a project that we did at Kiel, um, where we were, we had loads of boilers racked up, some having 20% blend, some not. The boiler manufacturers didn't know which ones got what. We sent the boilers back after the end of the programme to see if they could tell the difference. No differences were made. Um, we had consumers having 20 percent. They didn't notice any difference either. This morning, the residents of Wynn Leighton up in Gateshead uh, as the second stage of this project, so they cooked their breakfast on 20 percent hydrogen. That's 600 homes. So we'll really get in there and be able to demonstrate that you can blend hydrogen. The next phase of the project is looking at commercial appliances and actually blends in, in larger pressure tiers in the gas network as well as thinking about how hydrogen is is in the home and how the network can take 100% hydrogen, we're starting to think about how do we join up hydrogen production centres. Um, so in the middle of this chart here, the high net hydrogen production facility, which is, is going to be at Ellesmere Port, and we've just received track one funding status for this cluster. Um, CO2 to blue hydrogen project is going to be captured in Liverpool Bay. And the hydrogen pipeline that we're building, which will see both blue and green hydrogen, by the way, is going to take, it's the sort of cross in the middle, take hydrogen from production down to salt cabins for storage and then up to industrial users. And we're looking at about 30 terawatt hours production by 2030. Um, so there's a huge amount of uh, hydrogen for the industries uh, in this region. And we've already been testing, there's Pilkington's glass have tested 100% hydrogen. They've made hydrogen glass for the first time ever. So we're really focusing what the fuel switching looks like for businesses here. But the reason why this is pointing from a heating point of view is customers want to know when this magic hydrogen is coming. And so you only really know when you, you've got a resilient supply of hydrogen is how these clusters are developing in the storage that fits alongside it so that you can start to create a map of how hydrogen is going to be rolled out. And we're doing something similar on the East Coast. So just this week we launched um, East Coast Hydrogen, which is going to take hydrogen from the uh, Humber and Teesside. And we're planning on where the route of the pipeline needs to go to deliver this hydrogen to industrial users who need 100 percent and then towns and villages along the way. Next slide, please. <coughs> and then my my nearly my last slide. So we're we're going to be planning the first village conversion to hydrogen. And we want we have to demonstrate this for the government to make a heat policy decision. 
and um, uh, we'll wait to find out um, if we're successful in receiving funding for it. But this will give us first hand experience of converting a whole place to hydrogen. And don't forget, we've done it before in the 60s and 70s when we converted from towns gas to natural gas. Um, and just the last thing I want I wanted just to summarise for you um, and apologies for the disruption in the in the audio earlier on. If you move on to the last slide, please. Um, there's some key things that we need to be doing. We need to show people the pathway to to low carbon heat for them, whether it's electric or hydrogen or, or district heating or whatever solution it might be. And we need to do this through the demonstration of real life projects. We can't expect people just to imagine their way into this future. We need to ensure there are options and choice. Um, and these are quite important, especially if you take them away. So um, bringing customers on the journey uh, with that is, is important. We really need to think about things on a local and regional level and then look at it nationally from a resilience point of view. I don't believe there's going to be a one size fits all solution for heating. We need everything and we need innovation in this space too. So let's not um, stop any technologies from um, developing. And obviously the public perception and safety and education, especially around hydrogen, is key. So that's that's all from me. Um, shall I try putting my camera back on just to see if it um if it works? I'm sure you'll let me know. Happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Angie. That that was that was great. Extremely interesting talk from from our perspective. Uh, lots of interesting stuff going on there, and you know particularly on those developments with hydrogen. Uh, yes, so apologies to the audience. There was a couple of problems with, with the audio, particularly earlier on while, while the camera was on. Um, I think for me, most of it came across. Um, uh, but if there are any questions, do feel free to put them in the chat to clarify, for Angie to clarify anything. We, we do have five minutes, maybe eight minutes uh, for Q&A right now. And that there are a bunch of interesting questions which have been posed. Um, so we'll probably have time to cover a few of them. If, apologies if we can't cover them all uh, in the time that we have, but we could we could ask Angie to answer them offline and um, and we could send out responses. The, the first question was actually posted before the talk began, and so it might, might have been directed at me, I'm not sure, but it's basically saying, considering what happened in COP26, what's the rationale for including a fossil fuel like natural gas alongside renewables and hydrogen and biogas? I think this is about the SGI, so, so I'll respond to that one. I think this is the trillion dollar question, what is the role of natural gas uh, in amongst those other zero or possibly even negative carbon energy vectors? And this is why the Sustainable Gas Institute exists. We're, we're interested in at least that's part of our remit is to help answer that question. Uh, and I think fair to say that a, a fair bit of it revolves around carbon capture and storage, uh, the role that that may play in future, and uh, which itself is a very interesting area with, with uh, a lot of projects worldwide, uh, some successful, some less so, and say uh, issues with markets and standardization and relative, relatively complex things like that. But just to say that's why we exist. So I don't want to dwell on that anymore because we have Angie here. Um, so moving on to, to the next question is, I mean, I think you kind of covered this in your talk, but if you just maybe highlight it again, what, what do you think the key challenges are for the uptake of hydrogen in the heating sector? And what, what immediate policy changes are needed to help reach the you know, government's goals? Yeah, so I mean, two things for me. One is hydrogen needs to make, be made cheaply enough for customers to adopt it. Now, in, in wind, it was subsidised for a while, green electricity. So we need to get customers buying hydrogen. Um, and if we need to subsidise that in the meantime, we should. Um, keep going on about this. <laughs> we need to get going. Um, and then the second challenge, I think, is about education. I really need to get customers starting to think about when they next replace their heating system, what it is that's best for them. And uh, there could be a range of different options there. Um, so I think those two things will make a big difference. Great, great, thanks. Yes, um, I still had a little problem with audio there. Let, let's keep going and see, see how we go. Um, <coughs> all right, so next question is uh, about 100% hydrogen in infrastructure. 
Um, so it looked to me from your, the latter parts of your presentation, you are considering this. Uh, can you just tell us tell us a bit more about that, the, sort of the more extreme end of the scenario where it is pure hydrogen as opposed to a blend? Yeah, a, a, a blend for us is just a stepping stone, right? There's no long term role for blended gas in the energy system. Right? We've got to remove natural gas. So 100 percent hydrogen conversion is the destination. And when I talked about the hydrogen village that we're planning, that would be a 100 percent hydrogen village. Um, so the, all the tests that we're doing on our network is really focusing on 100 percent hydrogen as being the the goal we might have to manage blends in the interim so that we've got enough hydrogen to manage the conversion. Yeah, I think that's a, the, the project looks a great example. Looking forward to seeing how it goes. So next question is a bit more focused on the heat pumps. Um, so as, as we know, they, they can be quite expensive. To, um, I know some companies are trying to drive down costs of the upfront capital of heat pumps. Um, and there are various claims out there about which cover a wide range. So I think you said 11,000 per home. Uh, this is how the question goes. The question is, does that cover infrastructure upgrades to, and I guess by that we mean reinforcement of electricity grids? Um, and what would you like to see from the government? Basically, well, I think you've already answered this, but to accelerate decarbonisation of heat. So that 10,000, by the way, is, is an estimate based, but it's on the CCC's work, right? So that includes um, their, their estimate of what they think it will take to decarbonise heating. But in actual fact, it depends on the technology that you pick. And so if you're picking a heat pump, it depends on your property, of course, but um, what yeah, ancillary equipment you might need, and whether you need an inside, you know, a hot water tank, whether you need... Um, underfloor heating or different radiators or insulation it, it you know it, it's it's it really is dependent um but in you've so you've got your heat pump costs which is i don't know somewhere between 7 and 15k depending on your property you've then got your insulation costs and then you've got your reinforcement costs i haven't seen great detail on reinforcement costs to date for electricity networks although there are they have been estimated in a lot of the models that are available yeah, I think it sort of depends where you are. There are sometimes upgrades needed, sometimes not. There's, there's actually, we're in, involved in an interesting project on network headroom and uh, addressing exactly that question. Um, OK, there's there's a question about the pace of hydrogen deployment. Obviously, there there's a strong ambition here and there's the ambition to net zero. Um, but the question goes, the government's delay of key decisions on hydrogen until 2026. Do you think this means that hydrogen will be too late to the party? Um, yeah, I think I think there's a danger that you know um, you could have delivered a significant proportion of electrification of heat by the time large volumes of hydrogen are available. However, I, I think there's still going to be a significant role for hydrogen because what's happening with electrification is just focusing on the things that are here and now and visible and easy to do. And governments actually focus quite sensibly on new builds and off grid. Um, and the decision on the role of hydrogen and the heat network will cover, you know, the remainder of properties that are on gas plus you know, anything else we need to do to support um, heat networks and, and electrification. So I, I think I think the timing's fine. I mean, I think it's um, of course it would have been preferable for us to start thinking about decarbonising gas quite a long time ago. Um, electricity has the march just because of how policy is driven renewables, which is brilliant. So um, we're definitely uh, behind the starting line a little bit. We've got a way to go. Perfect. OK, la last question and very brief because we only have a couple of minutes. But th and this is this is more from from my perspective. And it's when, when I look at heat decarbonisation in the UK, you see you know, this electrification, you see hydrogen, you know, potentially some biogases in very, very specific circumstances, also potentially heat networks. Um, also, you see strategies that looks like the solution might be localised and, you know, specific parts of the country have a specific solution but don't have access to you know, other possibilities for for heating their homes so maybe if there's a heat network nearby 
kind of need people to connect for the economics to work and you know, uh, equally with, with, with hydrogen, you know, perhaps parts of the country and others not. But do, what do you think about that? Is, you know, is this likely to work? Is it going to be cause problems and that, that choice that you mentioned and also potentially distributional impacts? If you've got a, a 30 second response to that, mm -hmm. fantastic. Um, yeah, my answer is yes, it's tricky. Um, I, I, I absolutely think we need to have local and local planning that rolls up to national planning. You need you need to have com community involvement in the, the plans that we're making because we have lots of conversations with the gas network about what do we do with the last person connected to the gas network? <laughs> you know, or how do we if every if we've got a street of heat pumps or a street of hydrogen, how do we deal with the one that doesn't want to? And these are the things that I don't think we've got answers to yet, but we have to work through. And I, I see it as a combined effort between the electricity and the gas networks working the working the solutions out together. Superb. Thank you very much, Angie. Unfortunately, we don't have time for any more questions, um, so I, I'm I'm going to wrap up. So so first, like, like I say, uh, uh, Angie, that was a really interesting presentation. Um, sorry about the audio issues. I'm good to see your camera on again, at least to say goodbye. Uh, but thank you very much for joining us and and um, re really useful stuff. Thanks also to the team in the background here, uh, Emily, Jasmine, Connor. Um, and of course, the audience, thank you very much for joining us. The video will be available to view uh, right away. Uh, you can also follow us on social media and you can subscribe to our newsletters and other events and see our latest publications. Um, if you've got any queries, you can also email us. You see, see the link there um, and uh, ask, ask any questions. Um, apologies, we didn't get to all the questions in the Q&A. Um, but we can we can send them to Angie, and if she's very very gracious, she may answer some some more of them for us, uh, which we can publish. So thank you very much, everyone. And uh, right on 1 p.m., uh, I'll, I'll leave you to your lunch or to your next meeting. Thanks very much, all, and good afternoon.